Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the Serenity OS update for February 2020. Now, before we begin, as always, let me tell you about sponsorship. So, the Serenity operating system and all of my content about it is always going to be free and open source. But if you would like to support my work and maybe one day make it possible for me to do this full time, then there are three donation options. So, I'm on Patreon. GitHub sponsors for those interested in monthly donations, and I'm also on PayPal for those of you who prefer making a one-time donation. And you can find links to all of these in the description below. And of course, a huge thank you to those of you who are already supporting me in some way. Uh, there has been a large increase in supporters in the last month, so welcome to all the new folks. It's really cool. So let's talk about February. So first thing is, I had a lot of things to do at work this month, so I ended up um, spending a bunch of time on more lightweight things in Serenity, uh, things I don't normally spend time on, like organizing the code into namespaces, uh, improving things like uh, incremental build times and stuff like that. Um, so, so a little bit less heavy things, but we also have some nice stuff to go through now. So <laughs> I guess I'll start with something fun. So after I talked about ladybug mascots in a commute talk the other day, uh, Simon drew a cute Serenity ladybug, and I thought, well, why don't we make that the system mascot? So <laughs> I took the liberty of adopting this fella, uh, naming him or her Buggy, uh, gender unknown. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's, finally we have a new icon for the system. So that's very nice. Um, and then something I worked on this month was a web server. So let me start that up. And I guess I'll open the browser. And this thing uh, runs on the local host here, port 8000 by default. Of course, I could also open it from my host machine, although I'm not going to do that now because I'm recording in the QEMU here. But yeah, it's a it's a nice, um, very basic web server, and of course the goal is to one day host serenityos.org in this uh, in our own web server. So uh, right now this is actually running on um, on my uh, on, on an Ubuntu server somewhere. But anyway, uh, that's that's web server. And another new thing this month is we have desktop notifications, so we can test them by sending something here a title, a uh, message for the user. And they will show up over here. And we can also send many. And they don't go away until you click on them. So um, that's pretty cool. That's, um, if we look here in the system monitor, we can see that uh, it actually runs as a service. Where are you? Da -da -da. Why can I not see it? I'm just going to sort by name. No notification. Wait, what? Oh, right. I totally forgot. <laughs> it loads on demand. So um, if I send a notification, then the notification server will spawn. That's why we couldn't find it. And then when you dismiss the notification, the notification server goes away. And that's actually driven by uh, system server, which has this on-demand uh, service launching, which is really cool. And uh, thank you, Sergey, for implementing that, by the way. Love it. And as you can see here, it runs as a notify user. Um, so I've done a bit of work on process separation and things like that this month. You can see um, not just notification server running as a different user, but if you go down here, we can see Windows server running as a separate user as well. And this means that my normal user account here, the Anon user, it's not him running Windows Server anymore. Instead, it's a separate user. Um, and I've done more and more work on this, on just separating different responsibilities in the system into different user accounts to segregate and just to isolate things from one another. And of course, the idea is that you're not supposed to notice that this is happening. It's just something you can come across if you look in the process table, for example, and you see that, hey, wait a minute, who's this user? And why is he running Windows Server? So uh, something that was necessary to make this work well was taking the system menu and splitting that out into a separate process. So system menu is now a separate program that runs as the Anon user. 
and it's responsible for creating this menu here, um, so that we can have, um, you know, so that we can have stuff launching from the right user account. Um, but it's also nice because it means that we can take away um, app execution privileges from Windows Server because previously uh, Windows Server ran the system menu and so it was able to start programs. Now we can take that away. Pretty neat. Um, so something else that I worked on this month. Let's see. I can show you the um, the new profiling workflow. So I spent a bunch of time working on the profiling this month and. It's pretty nice now. We can actually, um, wait a minute. No, not system server. That's not what I wanted to run. <laughs> system monitor. System. Okay, it's good if I can spell correctly. Okay, so now this thing here is being profiled when we're running it. So let me actually show you something new, by the way. Um, we have this new thing here called the page map. Uh, and this actually visualizes the uh, physical pages inside of a memory region. So we can see here, if we look at this um, ELF executable mapping, for example, we can see that uh, it's a little bit hard to see with this theme. Let's just go back to normal. That um, the black here is physical pages and the white is unused memory. So um, it's the same as we see over here, like the, this region is this big in terms of virtual memory, but only this many kilobytes or this many bytes are resident and this represents the bytes that are resident, so you can kind of see them visually. Um, I think that's it's very interesting, and it's not something that I've seen before. And likewise, you can see here that uh, this is a malloc block, and we can see that there's a, a bunch of unused space in this malloc block. Um, kind of neat. <laughs> anyway, if we close this now, and remember we were profiling it, so let's just open the profiler. And it'll take a moment to load. But here we are. So we can go in here and see what the system monitor was doing when we were running it. Seems like he was spending a lot of his time in event, paint event. Event dispatch, painting. What are you painting? You are painting. We have to go deep here. Oh, now it's starting to split up, actually. Table view. Yeah, so it's the process table spending time in sorting stuff, and it's just basically what you would expect the uh, system monitor to be doing. And of course, we can turn the profile upside down and see what it's actually, where it's spending most of its individual stack frame times. And you'll notice here that uh, kernel frames are now not symbolicated, so we can't see what those are. Um, that's kind of a security measure. So actually, we, if you become root, then you are able to symbolicate kernel stack frames. Um, so we'll just rerun the profile viewer as root, flip it upside down, and now we can see that um, the kernel is in the fault handler. Page fault handler, when we are doing what? We are reading from the procfs all file, and that's tripping up page faults. And then we have malloc and free. A lot of malloc and free in JSON code. So probably there's a lot of opportunity to optimize here, actually. But that's not something we have to get into right now. Although I should mention that I spent a whole bunch of time uh, optimizing malloc and free both in user space, so the standard C library malloc and free, and also in the kernel, the um, K malloc and K free. Um, all of these things have been optimized quite a bit, which had a very nice effect on compile times. Uh, when you're running GCC inside Serenity. And I can also show you that we now have a new port this month. It's a git port. Um, I ported git to Serenity, took about an hour or so, and it works pretty well. Um, there are some bugs and some kinks to iron out, but I'm happy that at least we got started on that. So it's really nice. Um, so, Let's see, what else? Um, there's been a whole lot of like polish here and there in the system, and especially from uh, Tibor has been working a lot on that. So like these weird little things, like let me open up a text editor here, for example. And these things that, that you might not normally notice, but like if you're switching the theme, now things like the um, inactive selection uh, color, or the uh, selection color in an inactive window, 
is now themable. So it follows the system theme, whereas previously it was just um, static. And likewise, the ruler here, and I think the resize corners, these guys right here, and like all these little things, like just fixing them. Um, very, very cool stuff. And um, he also did, uh, let me bring up the widget gallery. Um, we now have wheel events on these um, sliders here, so you don't have to drag them like this. You can also wheel, that's pretty cool. <laughs> There's just these little things, but I just love tiny little things like that. Um, and I think he worked on some tree view navigation with the keyboard and stuff like that as well, although it's hard to, to show. Um, and then some other small things. Um, let me open some more windows so I can show this actually. Um, so the window switcher here can now be clicked to switch windows, something that I always missed from macOS because I like that you can do this on macOS. You can just bring up the window switcher and then click on the thing you want or click on it to see what it is and then click on something else. Um, I always missed it and now we have it in Serenity so I'm very happy with that. Um, and then I did some work on drag and drop, continuing with that. So now you can drag a file into a directory. And sure enough, this file is now in this directory. Um, pretty basic, but it's nice to, nice to make a little progress on the, um, uh, things like that as well. And um, syntax highlighting is now available in text editor as well. Previously it was only in the Hack Studio IDE, but uh, I made the um, syntax highlighting code kind of generic so that uh, any GUI application can um, can say, hey, this is probably C++. Please, please highlight it as if it were. And um, that's really nice, I think, because oftentimes you just want to open up some uh, CPP or header file in the text editor and you don't want to uh, get the full IDE. Um, and something that, that you can't see in the video, but that I'm doing all the time right now, is we now have support for this um, virtual machine absolute mouse position, which means that when I drag my mouse cursor outside of the virtual machine window, it just smoothly keeps working on my uh, host machine desktop, and I just slide it back in. and. Uh, it might not sound like a big deal, but when you're working with the system like this all the time like I am, this makes a huge difference for ergonomics and is really, really awesome. So uh, that was implemented by Liav and uh, Sergey. So thank you very much, guys. It's, it's a really sweet feature. Um, and something else that, uh, like, I don't even know how to show really, but um, the block devices for hard drives, you can now actually uh, read and write them as if, as if it were a proper Unix. Like pre previously, it was not possible to read and write from these files. They just sort of existed, but you couldn't interact with them. And now you can actually do that. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, and what else? I guess I can show you the, um, the open file picker dialog now has uh, the ability to switch between different view types. So I think that's, that's a rather nice thing. Previously, it was always this table view, but now you can actually switch to the icon view. Uh, we're going to add the columns view as well once we iron out some bugs um, in, in some other code that, that is currently breaking it. Yeah, we'll get there, but it's really nice. And then just this little thing that always bothered me, but I want to show you anyway, um, that if I have a file called foo here, right? I have to run it with dot slash foo. It's just a copy of the id program. Um, and if I do foo, it says command not found. Now, previously, we would always search in the current directory, and you didn't have to type dot slash foo, but now we actually behave like a proper uh, adult system here, and we don't search dot for things. So it's just something small, but I really like it. Um, and there's been a bunch of... Um, more hardening work, especially in user space, like a lot more programs using uh, Pledge and Unveil, things like that. And there's been a ton of bug fixes in all layers of the system. Um, a lot of people contributing and the kernel keeps getting better. Um, we uh, have more and better validation of inputs. Um, 
and fix me's are getting fixed. And um, it's a lot of new interesting work towards um, interrupt management and uh, we're kind of slowly making our way towards uh, multiprocessor support, so that's kind of interesting. But we're not there yet, but we're, we're starting to put the pieces in place, and that's interesting. Um, and what else? I guess that's kind of all the things that I wanted to show you here. Now, there was something that happened this month that I was totally not expecting. Um, and I know I've talked about the potential portability of the system before, but uh, this month, well, I'm, I'm just going to invite uh, Joshua to talk about it. Hello, CyberPals. My name is Joshua Stein. I'm an OpenBSD developer and occasional Serenity OS contributor. I've been asked by Andreas to give a quick demo of Serenity's GUI running on top of OpenBSD's kernel. So this is the OpenBSD kernel booting. It will then spawn uh, in it and run the etc slash rc script which uh, mounts file systems and starts the network and that kind of thing um, and i've basically just inserted a line that executes uh, serenity's system server which then spawns serenity's uh, windows server uh, which has been modified to draw on openbsd's kernel frame buffer and interface with the keyboard and mouse devices th uh, through openbsd's wscons interface but otherwise, um, things are pretty much uh, OpenBSD underneath, but Serenity on top. So all the Serenity GUI things work uh, as you'd expect. Uh, there is this kind of weird artifacting that goes on. I'm not really sure what causes that. Um, might be something in Windows Server or the frame buffer implementation. I'm not sure. Uh, one other thing I had to change was uh, in libcore, the uh, function that um, grabs process information from the proc file system on Serenity. Um, it uses, uh, I modified it to use the uh, KVM interface on OpenBSD. So some of these columns are just not hooked up yet, but you can get the uh, list of pledges and things. Um, I did have to disable uh, most of the pledges on uh, in the Serenity um, programs because the uh, some of the pledges or pro uh, promises that they um, wanted to make are not available in uh, OpenBSD's kernel. Let's see, so the browser works, uh, networking works uh, obviously because it's going through OpenBSD's kernel. Uh, if you're interested in uh, seeing the amount of changes that were required to get this working, which um, hasn't been that many, uh, you can check out the uh, Git tree at uh, github.com slash jcs slash serenity, uh, or you can reach out to me on Twitter at jcs. Thanks. Bye. All right. Well, you have to admit that was pretty neat. So, yeah, this was basically everything for this month. Uh, thank you so much for checking in and for catching up with the project. If you ever want to chat, there is a very active community on IRC. You can find us in the Serenity OS channel on Freenode. And I will see you all next time. Bye.